Hi, I'm Scott. I'm the CMS person along with Holger who works with the UM most of the time. Um, so yeah, I'll just be going over a bit how you use the more modern form of the UM with the rose and silk system, uh, which is getting used by Access 2. So Access 2 is one of the CMIP6 submissions from the Australian climate community. Uh, the other one is Access ESM. Uh, they're both similar models. Access ESM is based on an older version of the atmosphere, uh, whereas CM2 is more up to date, as in it's a version from uh, probably two years ago now instead of 10. Uh, so the unified model is the atmosphere part of it. So it's what I'm mostly going to be covering today. Uh, this is developed by the UK Met Office. Uh, so alongside uh, the Bureau and CSIRO, uh, we make use of the, the UK system for most atmospheric modelling in the centre. Um, a few people use WARF as well, but sort of the, the climate community is supposed to be focusing on this access system. Um, so there's a few ways you can run access in terms of experimental configurations. There's a global atmosphere only mode, uh, which is normally called global atmosphere or GA. Uh, we've got the fully coupled system, which is access CM, the coupled model. So that's where you've got an atmosphere model plus an ocean model. Uh, we use MOM um, as well as a sea ice model, uh, which are all talking together as the model runs. So they're sending fields between each other. Um, so yeah, all of these are based on scientific configurations that come out of the Hadley Center at the UK Met Office. And for the access stuff, they're generally modified a bit to be more appropriate for the Southern Hemisphere, while the UK will normally uh, tune their models to be appropriate for their region. Um, so there's going to be a few things you need to set up before you're able to run the model. Let me just work out my screen. There we are. Um, so yeah, like I said, there was going to be a few things you need to set up before running the model. Uh, this is our uh, CMS wiki. If you just search Google for uh, CMS wiki, it should come up. This is where we keep most of our model and um, data documentation. So if you're looking for a data set, there's descriptions of where all those are on at NCI over here. Um, unified model, we've got some instructions on getting started here. Um, there's, basic, there's a few things you need before you're able to run the model. Firstly, you're going to need to join the access group at NCI. So that's just one of those project groups, like say W35 or W48. So you'd go to my.nci.org.au and join the access group. That gives you access to um, a couple things. So it gets you access to access the access dev server, which is where you log on to run the model. Um, and it also gets you access to some of the licensed um, stuff we use. So in the Tilda access area, uh, because the unified model is coming from the Met Office. It's actually a commercial model. So there is a license associated with it. Um, it the center has a licensing agreement with the uh, Met Office to be able to run the model at NCI. Um, so we should have instructions. Yeah, so you've got some setup instructions here that you can follow. Um, some of this is a bit out of date. So if you do run into problems following these setup instructions, let us know and we'll um, update things as we can. 
Um, so the other thing you'll need access to is the Met Office Science Repository. Um, so to get access to this, you need to email us at cws underscore help at nci.org.au and we'll um, ask the Met Office to set up an account for you. This is where all of the source code for the unified model, so the atmosphere part of access is. Um, it's also where most of the configurations are stored. So if you're wanting to run, say, the, the access um, latest configurations, you'll download them from here. Um, I'll show you how, that, how that's done in a little bit. Um, it also has model documentation and as well as some um, like utility programs. So if you're wanting to create your own input files to the model, um, say you want to change the ozone forcings or something, there's tools for how to do that in here and documentation. Um, so the important things here are the unified model is the model source. So that's where you go to to find well, documentation about the UM is pretty important. So if we follow this, we eventually get into the model documentation papers. So these are sometimes fairly in depth into the science behind the model. Some of them have like file format information um, as well as there's a, there's a basic user guide here that you can take a look at before you run the model, if you like. If you're going to contribute code back to the Met Office, say you've developed your own parameter scheme and you're wanting to add that back into the Met Office's version of the code, that's perfectly fine. It's per perfectly possible to do. Uh, you will need to follow their software standards before they'll let you add code into the model as well as they've got a number of working practices for how to create a ticket and stuff that you can follow. Um, and they do encourage con contributions from partners like the center. Um, so yeah, development working practices there. Uh, the other things that can be useful, there's the global model evaluation de and development page. So this has information on the uh, scientific development of the model for global models, and there's a similar one for regional models. So the Met Office develops the model source code and the science configuration separately. Um, so you'll have one version of the, of the, so of the software code, say UM version 10.6, will be able to run multiple versions of the science code and vice versa. So there might be a GA6 or a GA7 uh, science code, uh, science configuration. Um, and they've also got information on how the, the science changes are developed in here. Uh, you can follow this page and it'll tell you about documentation for the uh, frozen GA configurations. Um, GL is their land configuration. Uh, by default, the unified model uses a model called jewels for its land surface. Um, while access configurations normally use a model called cable. So the land surface configurations tend to be different between the two systems. Um, they've also got their own coupled model. Uh, called GC, uh, which is rather different from Access. Instead of using the MOM Ocean model, they have NEMO, which is a, a European ocean model. Um, this is used at the Bureau for um, seasonal prediction, I believe, uh, the UK coupled configuration. So it is used, but we, in a climate context, we normally wouldn't be using it. Um, so yeah, once you've got your membership to this, you can go through, take a look, take a look at the documentation and the how-to guides. 
um, all through here. Um, there's also some setup you'll need. You'll need to be able to log on to the access dev server. So I'll make a new terminal. So just like Guardi, you would SSH to the server. So SSH, my username, at accessdev.nci.org.au. Um, and we have access to the server. Um, we use a separate server to Guardi because of some of the programs we're, we're going to be running. They need to be able to run for a long time while jobs on Guardi generally get killed after, say, 30 minutes or so because NCI don't want long-running jobs running on the login nodes. Jobs on Access Dev can be run for weeks or months, saying, say, if you're wanting to run a big climate model over the period over the period of a, a month or two submitting multiple times onto Guardi. This will be able to keep things running and and talk to Guardi and 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 show progress and things like that. Um, so in our documentation we'll have in the setup guide information on how to set up SSH stuff. Yep, so you'll need to request a, a shared repository account and set up a GPG agent. A G, the GPG agent saves your password. So rather than having to enter in every time you're wanting to download the model code, your password, uh, you can do this and it'll save it for a day or so. Um, and we've got a helpful script here, which should check everything's working for you. Oops. So this will check your mem a member of the NCI group that you've got your GPG agent running and that your SSH connections are running between Access Dev and Guardi. Um, so for communication between the two systems, we need passwordless SSH. Uh, basically because it communicates quite a lot and you don't want to be entering a password every time. So it's checking that you have a running SSH agent saving your password and you can then run SSH Guardi and we don't need to enter any passwords and the same backwards. You can go from Guardi back to access dev. Oops, I might need to do... So you can go back and forth between the two machines without any passwords. So yeah, we've got guides here on the Climate CMS wiki. There's also the Access Dev uh, wiki, if I can evade Zoom's control panel. Um, so this is just a website, accessdev.nci.org.au just like the server we SSH to. Um, and this has information which is more wider for the access community. So CSIRO and the Bureau will also be contributing to this documentation here. Um, so you have things like from CSIRO, the access models being run under CMIP6. Okay, so the other thing we can take a look at is in our documentation here. Um, we've got some information on the experiments we're able to run. Um, so we can follow through here and this is showing our information on Access CM2, which is the model we're going to be taking a look at today. Um, so we can see we've got a few versions of this. So this is the Pi control, so pre-industrial control CMIP6 run we'll be taking a look at here. Um, each job gets identified by a job ID, which is generally U dash two letters and three numbers. 
Um, that's part of the Met Office's job identification system. So we're just using the same system. Um, and we've also got a link to uh, a documentation paper that uh, CSIRO has sent us, which you can go through to find some of the information um, on the specific setup of this model. Uh, there will presumably be a paper published if there's not been already on the model as well, which you can look at for um, configuration details. Um, important things to note whenever you're going to run a model is how much it will cost. Um, so in this case, for running CM2, it's pretty expensive. It's going to cost 7,000 SU per year. So an SU is basically the charge unit uh, from NCI. So if we go on to Guardi, and I'll just clear this, you can run NCI account, and it will show, show us how much um, resources we have in my current project. So I'm currently using W35, which has 200, a grant of 280 KSU per quarter. So if this costs seven KSU per model year, um, I'm fairly limited. I could run say 28 years if I was the only member of this project. So this, pro this uh, allocation is shared between all of the members of your project. So if you're wanting to run this for a long time, uh, talk to your other project members and make sure there's going to be an allocation available. Um, so yeah, let's start off actually taking a look at the model configuration. So I'll go to a terminal. Um, let's make it a bit bigger so you can see. Uh, so to start off with, we want to make a copy of the configuration ID. So back here, we had our configuration ID U-BR565. What we can do is say Rosie is the um, experiment database browser. Uh, so you can say from the experiment database, copy this job ID, so U-BR565. And just press enter. Um, I need to say, run one of these um, setup things. I need to say MOSRS auth because I haven't saved my password. So I am just going to copy it from here. Evading zoom. Cool. Now that my password has been saved, I can copy it uh, without having to enter that password again. Um, the experiment database lets you enter some meta metadata here. Um, owner ha is important because uh, only the owner can change that experiment. So make sure it's using your own uh, MetOffice username, which it should default to. Um, otherwise you can change, say I wanted to change the project to Clex or whatever. That's all fine. Um, and then save and quit. This will open up in whatever your default editor is. Um, so I've got it set to Vim, you could set it to Nano or whatever. And then it's going to ask us to verify we want to copy that, so U-BR5 job ID, to a new experiment. Um, behind the scenes, this is using a version control system called Subversion. Um, if you're familiar with that, it works pretty much the same as Git. Um, so it's all, all of the experiments are stored in a version control dart database so you can go back in back undo changes and things like that uh, which can be handy as you're developing configurations so 
So that's going to copy along. So we'll go over to this other version, which I've already done that. So I've copied it in this case to U-BU793. From here, we can edit the configuration. Um, the configuration is stored as text files. You can edit them directly. Um, if we look, pardon me, at rosesuite.conf, um, we've got a whole lot of um, settings. Uh, these basically get turned into Fortran nameless when the model gets run. Um, but generally, rather than changing the text files, what you'll do is run rows edit to open up the nameless editor. And you get a window like this. Oops. Um, so the advantages of this is it's got documentation on what all of the settings are um, and it will check the values are appropriate. Um, so just going through the basic, we've got top level options under suite configuration. Um, so these will be fairly generic. And then we've got settings for the individual models. So we've got size, which is the ice model. Um, so that has some files that get set up and some name lists that get set up. So you can go through here and edit the name list values. Uh, presumably if you're familiar with SICE or have read its documentation on what name list values to change. Same thing for MOM, the ocean model. We've got files and name list values, which we can change settings here. And the UM has the same sort of idea. It loads. Um, but here, rather than just the nameless names, it's organized into uh, different settings, different sections. Um, and you can go through here and change stuff like your start times or what type of model you're going to be running. So starting back from the top, uh, when you're running the model, the first time you run the model, you'll have to build it. So you compile each of the models, the UM, MOM, and SICE, as well as the driver scripts. Uh, you do generally only need to do this once though. So once you've run the model, so once you've hit play here and those have run successfully, you can turn these off and you won't need to do that again. Uh, reconfiguration, uh, generally you'll be starting from a, like the Pi control simulation or something like that. So you shouldn't need to turn this on. And then you've got the option to, if you only want to compile the model and don't need to run it, you can turn off running the model. Then you've got the domain settings. Uh, so this is basically how many CPUs to allocate um, in the X, Y, in the X direction and in the Y direction. So you've got a grid which you're splitting up into individual CPUs um, as you like. Um, for an existing set setup, you won't want to change these. These will have been optimized for the resolution we're running at and to make sure that the atmosphere isn't getting ahead of the ocean, for instance, where that would be uh, inefficient and wasting time. Uh, but you do have the options to set that for the atmosphere, ice and ocean. Uh, this is stuff like your input paths um, and the output path. So by default, it's set to output to scratch. You may wish to change that to GData uh, if you're wanting to archive this more permanently uh, once you've tested and set up a run. Uh, compute host is not going to change for a while, hopefully. So that's fine. And you've got coupling frequency between the two models as well. And the compute pro project you're wanting to run under. Uh, 
And here you have information on the target run length. So what date do you want to start at? Here it's starting the Pi control at 900, year 950, January 1st. So this is a ISO 8601 date. So we've got year, month, day. How long do you want to run it for? So here we're running for a period of one year. You might want to run it for 10 years. You might want to run it for one month, which would be 1M. And the cycling frequency is how long each segment will run for. So here we're running in link. We'll submit to Guardi a job that runs for six months. And then we'll submit another job that runs for six months and so on until we get to one year of total runtime. Um, so that should be a, a reasonable setting for this model. So you shouldn't need to change the cycling frequency too much. That'll affect how many restart files are output, um, for instance. Um, and then you've got the uh, individual model science settings. So uh, before changing any of these, you'll probably want to look into the model documentation for what they're doing. Um, but for instance, if we wanted to change some convection settings as an experiment, we could do that here. Um, go into the science settings of the UM section and change things here. Uh, you've also got output. So this will affect, if I can get this right, stash requests. This specifies what model variables get output, how often, if they're getting me, a mean applied to them or stuff like that. Uh, so we can go through here. Uh, these are all um, what's called stash variables within the model. So this is specifically for the atmosphere. Uh, the ocean and sea ice uh, will have different settings, uh, different ways to specify which variables get output. Um, but we can go through, uh, is it possible to change the model resolution in the GUI? Um, yes, it is bit that will require setting up some extra um, files. So you would need to set up a land mask file and a uh, land fraction file. And then you could go into um, grid sizes. We could say we want instead of 192 by 144, which is what they call N96 uh, resolution. Uh, we could change the resolution here. Oops, so yes, back to outputs. So we could add a new variable. Um, say we wanted to add something from the clouds. We could go through and say, the low cloud top in feet above sea level. Um, some of these have extra uh, documentation if you hover over them, probably mostly the primary fields. Yeah. So if you hover over here, no, it's, oh, here we go. So here we've got some description of what's contained in that variable. Um, it's not always available to every every variable, but we can go and we can say, I want this variable in particular. Um, soil moisture content is probably already there. Um, and then you've got these three columns here. So we've added our variable, and then we want to say, how was it saved to a file? Um, so domain name. So this is uh, basically horizontal domain. Oh. So we could say, no, do, domain sort of in space rather than time. So we could say all row levels, if this was a variable on row levels or all feeder levels, 
um, this is how the row and feeder level split is due to how the model's set up. Um, some variables are defined on row levels, some are on feature levels. They're offset by half a half a, a grid half a grid point for stability reasons. And then you have things like diag is for surface level variables. You've also got some pressure level selections here. So I could say I want the surface, this is a surface field. I want it, say, either at every three hours or the mean of every three hours or every time step or every day, daily minimum, maximum, mean. Um, so it will do this time processing within the model. So say I want the daily minimum soil moisture content. Um, and then we've got use name. This is basically what file does this get output to? Um, so the model can output multiple variables to a single file. And you can say, say all of the daily variables are in UP7 and all of the three hour variables are in UP8, the UP8 file. That's basically for your own organization. So we could see, say, daily means are in UPD. So if we wanted to add a new daily mean, we'd select UPD just to be neat. You can define your own, but um, if you do wish to, just ask us and we'll show you how, rather than going into it today. Uh, so we can also remove this section. Uh, if it's output, if the model's outputting too much and you don't care about some number of variables, say you don't need all of these um, pressure variables, you can disable them um, by either specifying ignore or you, I think you can untick them here and those won't get output to when the model runs, which saves on space a little, especially if you've got high temporal resolution for fields, 3D fields being output. Um, so yeah, so we've made some changes. We've turned off some variables. Once we've done that, we can save all of this setup and say run. So there's a run suite button here, so we can do that directly. Um, and that's still running, so I should probably stop that. That was just running the command that it's that it told me to um, when I tried to run it. So we'll try running again. Oops. Um, you can do this spot from the command line too. You just run row suite dash run and it will start running this, the system. Um, so this um, configuration system is called rows. So commands to do with the configuration will be rows. Um, and that opens a second program called silk, which is this one. Uh, this is basically a job scheduling system that more advanced than you'll find with PBS. So when you're running jobs by default on Gardi. Uh, so this is made for numerical weather forecasting. So they will have like observations coming in every few hours physically, and they have to wait for those before they can then gather up those files and then run a forecast based on them. Um, so this has a lot more like dependency uh, type information. So we can see, let's just make that bigger. So it keeps inside it a graph of how each task depends on another. So if we ungroup here, um, so it says I have to download the MOM source code and then go and compile MOM. 
and the same for each other component drive component file before I can run this um, coupled the coupled model. Um, so we can see here grey um, things are completed, green ones are currently running, so they will be submitted to Guardi. So we can see here this task is running on Guardi as a queue job. Um, and we should be able to go to Guardi and say uh, queue stat. And here we have our two running jobs on Guardi. Once the job completes, it will send a message back to Access Dev saying, hey, I've completed my job. And then Silk will decide if a new, new task needs to be submitted. Uh, we've got a couple things here which have failed. So fail jobs turn red. We can right click on a job, either in this graph view or there's the same menu um, in this view. If we right click on a failed job and take a look at its uh, logs. So if something, fa something fails, it's a good idea to look at the error log, which we can do here. And here we have a bunch of error messages. Most important one says authentication failed. So that means I need to save another password. I saved before the MetOffice password. I also need to save my NCI password in a similar manner uh, using access auth. Um, so I'll just go to NCI and copy my password from there. So now I've fixed that error. So I can go here, right click and rerun that task now that I fixed the error. And it will go and start, start it running again. So now it's green for running. So we fix that error. Uh, this is probably the same error. So I'll just uh, resubmit it. So now that task is complete. So it's thinking about running FCM make two drivers. Now it's submitted light green. So it's submitted onto Guardi, but it's not started running yet. And now it started running. So you can also right click on here and view the job.out log. Um, if you're wanting to see, check for error messages or warnings and things like that or check what the resource requirements were. Um, so yeah, we've also, so let's take a look at where that actually runs. So if I go to Guardi, we'll take a look at where that's actually running and where we can find um, input files and stuff like that. So Silk will run all of its jobs in a directory called um, Silk Run in your uh, home directory. So we can go tilde slash Silk Run. And then there'll be a folder for each um, experiment. So we can go into we're running experiment u-bu793. So we can go u-bu793. Oops, wrong one. So again, we're on Guardi here. So we're seeing all of the files that, that are being run on the supercomputer. Um, so within this experiment directory, we've got a, a log directory, uh, which will be important for finding error logs. Uh, you can view them by right clicking on, on Silk, of course. So we can view the job.error and job.out there. Uh, but if something goes wrong and that's not working, you can go to log job, the date where it's running. So remember we were starting at year 950 January 1st. So that's the date being used there. 
and then the task. So the task name here that's being run. So let's say FCM make drivers. We've got FCM make drivers. Uh, you can run a job multiple times. So if you, you could have a run number one, run number two, and so forth. NN is just your last uh, run. So we can see, go to that last run. And there we've got both the job that it was actually submitted to the queue, as well as your error and output files. Um, if you need to access them outside of Silk. Um, there's also the work directory. That's the directory where things actually get run. So if we take a look at, uh, say, coupled, I don't think it's been submitted yet, but we should have an old one. CD work coupled. So this is where your actual name lists end up. So we can look in. My keyboard's frozen, but under Atom Runder will be our atmosphere name list files. Under Couple Runder will be the coupled files, couple of files. Uh, same for Ice and Ocean. So we can say LS Ocean Runder. Um, then we can see our mom input.nml file. It gets generated from that uh, rows configuration. So our values in here, oops, everything's running very slowly, but our, our, our values we set in the uh, mom setup in this page end up in this file. So ocean render input.nml. And this is just your normal Fortran name list that gets read in by the model. Um, there is also, in addition to that work directory, so if we go back up, let's take a look up here then. But there's also a share directory. That is where uh, the job gets compiled. So your source code gets downloaded into this share directory in a folder named by the model type. Um, under here, you'll also have model output will be written as the model gets run into this share directory. Um, that will be as the model writes it out. So for the UM, that will be output in uh, unified model binary files. For MOM, that will be output as one file for each processor that needs some post-processing to join back together. Um, so that will be raw output gets put into that share um, directory. Um, there's also post-processing functions as part of this suite. So uh, so once after it's run the coupled model, it will do post-processing on all of those raw model files and convert them into more usable formats. So if we go back to here, so remember we had under here somewhere, our archive directory. So we can go under there. So this is Oops, Oops. One. this one, sorry, just keeping track of all of my terminals. So that's this directory here. So I'll go to it directly, scratch w35, my username, archive bu793. So under here we'll have history. So this will contain the model output files for each component um, in NetCDF file, in NetCDF format. 
So this won't be necessarily be the files as they get published to CMIP. So some extra post-processing still needs to be done. Um, but you can go in here and say, let's load NC view. And we can see it still needs the field names done properly. Um, but we can go through and say, this has the surface sensible heat flux or the 1.5 meter temperature. Um, so we can go through our NetCDF file here. The same for uh, history, ocean. So we've got our daily ocean fields. So we can load them in your favorite NetCDF viewing format uh, program. Um, one thing to note, the ocean model uses a tripolar grid. So just viewing in X, Y, you do see some distortion here. Uh, there are within the file latitude and longitude uh, arrays, which you can use to, to plot them properly. Uh, but here we've got the sea surface temperature um, from running, a, running the model. Um. So yeah, that's sort of a, a basic overview of the Access CM2. Uh, the other thing to note, if you've got a raw uh, UM file, so before it's been post-processed, which we can find under here. So this is one of the raw restart files. So this is in a, a binary format that's specific to the UM. So if you're wanting to look at those, there's a program under tilde access um, apps xconv xconv. So this xconv program we can use to take a look at the fields within that file. Uh, if you're just wanting to get a basic idea before it gets converted to NetCDF, or if you're checking for an error, so like if the models become unstable and you're trying to work out why, you can go through here and step through each of the fields. So we can, if we evade the zoom window, plot our U wind field, for instance, uh, directly without having to do any conversions. And there we go. Um, so I've covered a lot there. Were there any questions people had? No, that's all right. So hopefully that's been um, useful. Like I said, we do have a decent amount of information up on all of these different wikis. Uh, if you're running into trouble, please do let us know. Email cws underscore help at nci.org.au uh, to get in touch with us or get in touch on the CMS Slack. Scott, I, I just had one uh, quick question about um, pacemaker runs. Can you do those uh, with this uh, rose and silk system? Uh, not sure. What are pacemaker runs again? Sorry, Ben. Uh, yeah, so it's basically where you uh, set uh, you set a, an SST field, um, you know, you and and let the let the atmosphere respond to that. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely run the model in atmosphere only mode with mm. a prescribed SST. So you'll need yep. to get your SST field regrid it to uh, the UM grid and convert it to the UM's input format, which is all perfectly doable. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks again for, to everyone for coming. Um, 
yeah, let us know if you've got any questions or suggestions on documentation that needs updating and stuff like that. Um, we're always happy to take a look. Um, there's the link to our um, email address or our Slack page. Uh, you're welcome to join. We've got one more chat. Yeah. So thanks again. Uh, we'll see you next week. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but we'll work something out.